speck of dust. My dear friends, I am certain that you realize the great satisfaction it gives me to be with you again to talk with you about anthroposophic matters. Of course, but when it does happen, we can establish a direction for further work on matters that concern us. And this is always the basis for our being together, even when we are unable to meet physically. We are brought together this time to form the Dutch Anthroposophical Society. Given the present conditions, it is vital to establish the societies of various countries so that a truly individual foundation is established to meet adequately the needs of our time. The General Anthroposophical Society will be established at Christmas in Dornach, and it will come into being only when the individual societies of each nation are represented in a way that their delegates are truly able to express the essence of each anthroposophic entity. Thus, by establishing the General Anthroposophical Society, we can do something that is very necessary, significant and important. If you can share with me a sense of how vital these matters are for our time, we will all acquire the right mood for our days together. And it is in just such a mood that I express my own most cordial greetings and heartfelt gratitude for your kind words to me. The theme proposed for our lectures is the supra-sensory human being, as it is perceived and understood through anthroposophy. We will attempt to express supra-sensory knowledge and understanding of the human being from many different perspectives. Since there can be only a few lectures, I will plunge right to the heart of the matter. When we speak of ourselves as supra-sensory beings, we are immediately at odds with the way the human being is described today. For quite some time now, no one, not even one of the idealists, has spoken about our supra-sensory being. The conventional culture and knowledge of our time never mentions the being who passes through births and deaths. Over the centuries it has become very natural to teach our school children that a newer world view demonstrates that the earth is merely a, in quotes, speck of dust in the cosmos, and that this speck of dust, together with an even smaller speck of dust, the human being, moves through the universe with delirious rapidity. It is said that this human being is completely insignificant in relation to the grand cosmos. This notion of earth as a speck of dust has permeated every human mind and heart. And as a result, people have completely lost the ability to connect humankind with what exists beyond the earthly realm. But there is something that speaks to us today, though it remains unconscious and we are unaware of it. It speaks today in clear, unmistakable tones and urges us to turn our attention once more to the suprasensory nature of our own being along with that of the world. For the past few centuries, materialism has found its way into our very knowledge of the human being. What is this materialism, really? Materialism is a worldview that sees the human being as a product of physical substances and forces. Although there are many who maintain that the human being is not made up only of physical substances and forces, we have no science that investigates the aspect of human nature that does not arise from earthly substances. Today, when well-intentioned people say that the eternal in human beings can be understood, nevertheless, such a claim is not completely honest. It is not simply a matter of refuting materialism. Today it is thoroughly superficial to want simply to disprove it at every opportunity. The most important thing is not the theories based on materialism, which create doubt upon the, about the spiritual realm or completely deny its existence, or at least the possibility of knowing that world. The important matter is the tremendous significance of materialism. Ultimately, what is the purpose when those motivated by some condition of soul 
or by religious traditions, say that human thinking, feeling and willing must exist independently of the brain, particularly since contemporary science comes along and removes parts of the brain bit by bit, primarily as it investigates the brain in pathological states, while at the same time seeming to dispose of the human soul a little at a time. And what is the use of some soul disposition or religious tradition leading to talk about the soul's immortality if the only remedies we can think of to help someone with a sick soul is to administer remedies for the brain and nervous system? Materialism has produced all this. There are many who are prepared to disprove materialism today, but they really do not know what they are doing. They cannot appreciate the tremendous significance of the detailed knowledge materialism has given us, and they have no idea of its consequences for our whole understanding of humankind. So let us begin here. We will go right to work by looking at the human being honestly, just as modern science does, and thus something will then reveal itself to us. Using all that physiology, biology, chemistry and other sciences can contribute to our understanding of the human being, we will learn how the various substances and forces of the earth come together to build muscles, nervous system, circulatory system and the various senses. In other words, the whole human being spoken of by conventional science. Here we encounter a striking body of information we find modern science in its most successful manifestation. Let us consider, for example, the knowledge that medical students must have concerning the human being as the basis for their work of healing. Having become acquainted with certain preparatory sciences, they then move on to subjects that are fundamental to medicine. Let us imagine that we are looking at a handbook that collects everything such a student is required to learn about the human being. Imagine, here is a summarized textbook of all that the doctor must learn about the human being up to the point of going into a specialization. Now, let us ask ourselves what this is. What do we know about the human being? We must say that we know a great deal. We know all that can be known today. But when we turn to psychologists whose vocation is to understand the soul, we encounter an atmosphere of doubt and uncertainty. First, we become aware that natural science has attained valid and worthy results through research. It is so good, in fact, that lecturers on science are often unequal to the task themselves. Students are extremely bored by what they must listen to in pre-medical courses. This is not because of natural science, but those who explain it. We should never say that science is boring, only its professors. Indeed, the fault does not lie with science, because science offer, certainly offers solid and beneficial material. I want to say that no matter how God-forsaken scientists have become, science itself is good. But when we turn from the achievements of genuine scholarly research and listen to psychologists and philosophers speak of the soul or the eternal aspect of the human being, we quickly realize that aside from what earlier traditions left us, it is all words, nothing but useless words. Today when we turn to psychology or philosophy because of the deepest needs of our soul, we are not merely bored but find nothing at all in answer to our questions. Consequently, we can say that only natural science offers real knowledge today for those who seek it. What does natural science teach us about the human being? It tells about what comes into being as a human being at conception or birth and what passes away at the time of death, nothing else. In all honesty, we must admit that science has nothing else to offer. There is only one alternative for those who want to be honest in this area. They must turn to something that cannot be gained through today's conventional scientific methods, a true science of the soul and spirit 
based, just as ancient spiritual knowledge was, on observation and experience of the spirit. Such a science can be attained only through the kind of methods shown in my books titled How to Know Higher Worlds, titled An Outline of Esoteric Science, and others. These methods enable us to truly perceive the spiritual and to speak of it just as we speak of phenomena in the physical sensory world, which has led to the development of a healthy natural science. The earthly object of our senses and research has not been exhausted by any means, though it is well on the way. But it yields only knowledge of the transient, material aspect of the human being living in time. Thus we can never see beyond the earthly realm, as long as we try to understand the human being only through such natural scientific methods. When we look only at the earthly, we see only the transient aspects of humanity. We will see, however, that this transient human aspect cannot be understood in and of itself. We are challenged to turn from the earth and look out into all that surrounds it. When conventional science does this, it merely determines distances to the stars, describes their courses, and examines their spectra or light phenomena that tell us the stars contain substances like those found on earth. This science of the realm beyond the earth, in fact, does not go beyond earth at all. It is powerless to do so. Therefore, to begin with, I want to speak to you of certain points that will be confirmed in the later lectures. When we direct our gaze out to the world of stars, rather than limiting our observation to earth and modern science, we first encounter the planetary system of heavenly bodies, which in a certain sense are related to earth. They move in a way that is believed to circle the sun, similar to the way earth moves around the sun. The planets also move along with the sun through cosmic space. One can gain such knowledge through observation and calculation, but it is not useful to us as human beings. This sort of observation really contributes nothing to our understanding of human beings. Suprasensory sight leads us immediately to something else. We gaze toward the neighboring planets as they are situated beyond the Earth, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, back to Earth itself, Mercury, Venus, and Moon. In this sense, we regard the Moon not merely as a satellite, but as a planet like Earth. Contemporary science calculates that Saturn, for example, takes 30 years to move around the Sun in its immense orbit. Jupiter needs a much shorter time, and Mars even less. Let us look out into the starry heavens at a star, that is, a planet at a particular point in the sky. Elsewhere, we see another planet, Saturn, Jupiter, and so on. We look with our sensory eyes and see Jupiter here or Saturn there, but they also have an etheric sphere. It is embedded in a fine, delicate ethereal substance. When we look at Saturn, for example, an oddly formed planet appearing to ordinary sight as a sphere surrounded by rings. If we can perceive the ether as well, we see that it accomplishes something in the ether surrounding it. Saturn is active in the ether that contains and encloses its planetary sphere as a whole. The eye of the spirit, EYE, sees that Saturn radiates forces which may be perceived as a formation. The physical aspect of Saturn is only one element of the picture, one that gradually fades before the eye of the spirit. A spiritual view gives us the feeling that the world spirits gave Saturn its position in the heavens for our benefit, so to speak, to show us the direction in which to look. When we look with a spiritual eye, EYE, it is as if something were drawn on a blackboard, merely as a point of reference, and then something is drawn all around it, after which the point of reference is erased. 
This is what happens automatically for spiritual sight. Saturn is blotted out, but what surrounds it becomes increasingly clear and speaks a wonderful language. Once Saturn is blotted out and we see the form worked into the ether, then we find that this form extends all the way to Jupiter, where this process is repeated. Jupiter erases itself, and what manifests in the ether spreads very far, and again a formation arises in the ether. This combines with the form from Saturn to produce an image in the heavens. The same thing happens in relation to Mars. Then we come to the sun. Whereas the outer physical sun blinds and dazzles, we find that this is not true of the spiritual sun. All the dazzling quickly dies away as we gaze at the spiritual sun. A great, majestic, living picture arises from everything inscribed into the ether. A picture that extends to Mercury, Venus and Moon. Thus, we have the image as a whole with its various parts. At this point, you might suggest that there are times when Saturn, for example, comes to a place in the heavens where it does not connect with the image formed by Jupiter. Strangely enough, this is also accounted for, because what we see comes together in an odd way. If you make a line in the earth that extends from a certain point in the east or Asia through the earth's center, elongating it from the other side out into the universe, such a line would assume an extraordinary significance for our spiritual sight as a whole. If Saturn lies beyond this line, we must carry the picture that arises from Saturn over to the line. There it becomes fixed. These images always fix themselves for our view by means of this line. Wherever we may see the image of Jupiter or Saturn, and we must look for them, they are fixed in our sight by this line. Now, we have a completely unified picture. Our planetary system presents a uniformly formed picture. Do you recognize this picture? Once we figure it out, we discover that it is a cosmic image of the human skin and our sensory organs. If you could draw an image of the cosmos from the human skin and the sensory organs, it would depict exactly what I have just described. The planetary system inscribes in the cosmic ether what exists in the human being, as specialized by earthly conditions, as the three-dimensional image of the skin surface, including the sensory organs. This, then, is the first thing. We discover a relationship between the earthly human being, our form given by the skin that encloses us, and the planetary system that shapes and builds the archetypal heavenly picture of the earthly human being into the ether. Then we discover a second phenomenon. We see the planets in movement. If we look at a particular planet, the Ptolemaic and the Copernican systems each present a different image of the path it follows. This may very well be the case. Pictures of planetary movements can be interpreted in the most varied ways. But more important, however, is the fact that we can perceive all these movements together. Saturn has the longest distance to go and requires the longest time to complete its orbit. Its movement in conjunction with the movement of Jupiter gives us a picture. And if we look in this way, then a whole picture arises from the movements of all these planets taken together. And we can reinterpret the picture that arises from the movement of the planets. This picture does not agree with the astronomical descriptions of the planetary movements. Strangely, spiritual sight does not find the ellipses found in astronomical maps. When, for example, we follow Saturn with spiritual sight, something is revealed that seen in conjunction with other movements forms a figure 8, or a kind of lemnus gate. And all the other various planetary movements play into this, and this presents still another picture. 
The picture that arises from all the planetary movements reveals itself to us as the heavenly image of the human being expressed in the nerves and adjacent glands. Spiritual sight discovers this archetypal image of the human skin and sensory organs in the sequence and arrangement of the planets. We have seen what happens when we go from this to the image of the planetary movements. If we draw an outline of the human form, we may sense that this outline represents the form of the planetary system. But when we include the nervous system and the secreting glands, with every stroke we have the sense we are drawing a physical picture of the movements of the whole planetary system as seen by the eye, EYE, of the spirit. Now, we can advance another step in our spiritual observation of the cosmos. We have reached the point where we have a picture of the planetary movements by including in our drawing the nerves and adjacent glands. Now we can progress in our knowledge. As we do, the various movements fade away. When we rise from imagination to inspiration, the individual movements vanish. This is extraordinarily important. Footnote, Rudolf Steiner uses the terms imagination, inspiration, and intuition not in their usual sense, but to describe inner capacities that are attained as one ascends to higher levels of spiritual awakening. See Rudolf Steiner's title, Stages of Higher Knowledge, and uh, uh, a lecture lecture entitled Imagination, Imagination, Inspiration, Self-Fulfillment, Intuition, Conscience, contained in title, A Psychology of Body, Soul, and Spirit, Anthroposophy, Psychosophy, Pneumatosophy, and a footnote. What one can call seeing, in the narrower sense, disappears from the whole picture. It is suddenly gone. Now, however, we begin to, in quotes, hear spiritually. What was movement before now becomes indistinct and vague, swimming into one another until it becomes like a picture seen through a mist. Out of this misty image, however, the music of the cosmos begins to form. Cosmic rhythms become spiritually audible to us. Now, we can ask, what must we add to our outline of the human form that corresponds with these cosmic rhythms? As we know, through art, all sorts of transformations are possible. As we outline the human being, and within that, the nervous system, we have the feeling that we have actually been drawing. Nevertheless, we cannot directly paint what we hear in the realm of cosmic music, because it is all rhythm and melody. To represent this in our picture, we must take a brush, and following the nervous system, quickly dab some red here, blue there, again red, and again blue, and so on along the lines of the nervous system. At certain places we feel a pull to stop. We must reach out and paint in a special, in quotes, form that expresses what we hear spiritually. We can indeed transform what we hear there into drawing, but when we want to place it within the outline, we must at certain points widen it to make a completely different structure, because here the rhythm blue-red, 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 suddenly becomes melody. We must paint in a form that sings to us a cosmic melody and rhythm. Once we have drawn everything into the picture, we have a spatially perceptible cosmic music. It is cosmic music that has become audible to spiritual hearing when the planetary movements have disappeared into a mist. What we have drawn into our image is the bloodstream. Then we come to an organ such as the heart or lungs or those that absorb substances from the outside world or from the body itself. And at these points we must paint forms attached in a certain way to the blood vessels. Thus the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys and stomach emerge. From cosmic music we insert the organs of secretion related to the bloodstream, drawing them into our blood system in our drawing. 
the secretion can be added as well. Let us take another step from inspiration to intuition. Something very special arises from the cosmic music. Something develops that forms the tones together. One tone affects another and we begin to hear meaning in this cosmic music. The cosmic music transforms into the speech of the whole cosmos. All that can be summed up in the term cosmic speech becomes audible. In earlier times, this was referred to as the cosmic word. And because it becomes audible, we must now draw something else into our picture of the human being. This becomes obvious to us. We must proceed just as we do in ordinary writing, in which we express something through words formed by letters. In this way we must express the meaning of individual cosmic words. We find that when we express these singular cosmic words and express them in our drawing, the the muscular and skeletal structures of the human being arise in this picture. It is as though someone had told us something and now we write it down. Cosmic speech tells us something and we draw it into our picture. We have found the whole human being through what the world beyond the earth tells us. But there is another, essentially different experience that comes to us through our observation. Let us return to the beginning of this whole process, the formation inscribed in the ether. While we practice this knowledge, the earthly element vanishes and remains only as a memory. If it did not remain as memory, we would be without any hold or support, which is essential when we want to know spirit. If spiritual knowledge excludes physical knowledge, it is no good. In physical life we must be able to remember, because if we could not recall our actions and experiences we would not be healthy. Likewise, within the realm of spiritual scientific knowledge, we must always be able to recall what is present in the physical world. Thus, as we enter the formative activities of the planetary system, for the moment we forget entirely the other knowledge we had on earth, all that we received from the wonderful achievements of physical science. No matter how thoroughly we studied natural science within the earthly sphere, In every instance of spirit knowledge we must each time reflect on and recall what we learned in the physical realm. We must continually remind ourselves that this is the solid ground we must stand upon. Nevertheless it withdraws and becomes like a memory. On the other hand, we now have another perception as something appears as the formative force in the planetary system. Compared to physical knowledge, it is alive and vivid, just as immediate experience compares to a memory. A wholly different environment confronts us at this moment. The beings of the third hierarchy are present now, the hierarchy of the archai, archangels, and angels. Footnote, these hierarchies are described in greater detail in Rolf Steiner's title Outline of Esoteric Science, and title The Spiritual Hierarchies, Reality and Illusion, and a footnote. We see that the third hierarchy lives within this form. A new world arises now before us. We no longer have to say only that the cosmic archetype of the human form arose from the planetary system. Now we can say that the beings of the third hierarchy, the archai, archangels and angels, are working and weaving this cosmic archetype of the human being. In our earthly existence, it is possible to attain perception of the hierarchical world through suprasensory cognition. After death, every human being necessarily experiences such knowledge. And the better we prepare ourselves, as we can, during earthly existence, the easier this will be for us. But we must all go through it. On earth, when we want to know our form, we can view ourselves or take a picture. After death, 
we do not have such means available to know our own or another's form. After death we must look out to the planets' formative activity and weaving. The planets reveal our form. There we recognize what I have described here as the human form. Woven into it, however, we see the angels, archangels, and archai of the third hierarchy working and weaving. Let us progress upward. We have seen how the weaving life of angels, archangels, and archai is related to the forms of the human skin and the sensory organs placed within it. Now we can learn more about our human relationship to the realm beyond earth. First, however, we must be very clear about the fact that we talk differently here on earth about a person's form having a certain shape. We speak of someone's forehead being t t formed in a particular way, of another having this or that shaped nose, while others have sad eyes or smiling eyes and so on. And this is the end of it. But cosmic knowledge leads us to see the active weaving of the third hierarchy in all that contributes to the human form. In fact, the human form is not an earthly creation. The earth merely provides the substance for the embryo, whereas the archai, archangels, and angels work in from the cosmos to build the human form. We now advance further and perceive the confluence of planetary movements, parenthesis, reproduced as our nervous system and the secreting glands, close parenthesis, and how they interweave with the beings of the second hierarchy, the exousiae, curiatites, and dunamis. And because the beings of the second hierarchy are connected and work in the, on the cosmic archetype of the human nervous and glandular systems, it later becomes our task after death, that is, some time after we have come to understand the human form in terms of its cosmic archetype, to ascend to the world of the second hierarchy. There we must come to understand how the physical human being, now recalled as a memory, was fashioned and created in the nervous and glandular systems by the exousiae, curiatites, and dynamis. Here we no longer regard the human being as a product of electrical forces, magnetism, and so on. Rather we know how, as physical human beings, we were formed by beings of the second hierarchy. Now we can go even farther, and by ascending to the sphere of cosmic music, cosmic melody and rhythm, we find yet another cosmic archetype of the human being. I have shown you how we draw this into our outline of the human being, but now we do not go any further in observing the hierarchies. It is again the second hierarchy, the exousiae, curiatites, and dynamis, who are active here as well, but their activity here is different. It is difficult to express how their way of working on the nervous system differs from their work on the rhythmic blood system of the human being. To express this, we must describe it as follows. As they work on the nervous system, the beings of the second hierarchy gaze down to earth. But when they work on the blood system, they look up. Both the nervous system and the blood system, as well as the organs connected with them, are created by the same hierarchy but their gaze is turned toward the earth in one instance and in the other upward to the spirit world and the heavens. Finally, at the stage of intuition, we see how the human muscular and skeletal systems are woven into being by the world of the cosmic word or cosmic speech. Here we encounter the first hierarchy, the seraphim, cherubim and thrones. We have thus reached the moment that corresponds approximately to the midpoint of life between death and a new birth. In my mystery plays, this is referred to as the, quote, midnight hour of existence, close quote. We must then 
See that the beings of the first hierarchy weave and create all the elements of the human organism that enable us to move around in the world. Consequently, as we view the human being with suprasensory cognition, we see a world of spiritual, cosmic beings behind everything. In our present age, in trying to understand the human being, we usually begin by studying the skeletal system, although this makes little sense, even in a superficial sense. Since the skeleton was formed and built up by the fluids of the human organism, the skeleton was not the first thing, but a residue of fluids, and it can be understood only in that sense. Nevertheless, what is the usual procedure? We must begin by learning the various parts of the skeleton, the bones of the upper arm, lower arm, the hands, the fingers, and so on. Most of us simply learn it all by rote. You know that most people learned it only by rote. It is the same with the muscles, although it is decidedly more difficult. When we come to the various organs, we learn about them in the same way. But there the concepts are largely thrown together pell-mell. In all healthy minds, however, there is a longing to know more about what lies behind it all and to know something of the mystery of the world. If we made observations based on the actual facts about the human being, this would be the result. We would begin by studying the skin and the senses embedded in it, which leads to perception of the hierarchy of angels, archangels, and archai. Then, as we go further into the human being to the nervous and glandular systems, this leads us to the second hierarchy, the exousiae, curiosities, and dunamis. We stay with these same beings when we get to the blood system and the organs. And when it comes to what this system has built up, to what gives us the capacity for movement, the muscular and skeletal systems, we ascend to the first hierarchy and an understanding of these systems as the creation of the seraphim, cherubim and thrones. It is possible in this way to describe the ascending ranks of hierarchical beings, from the third to the second to the first. When we describe the influences pouring down upon earth from beyond it, and in them we see the activities of the hierarchies, a marvelous picture arises before us. Gazing at the ranks of hierarchies, first we see the activity of the third hierarchical beings, angels, archangels, and archai. Then we see the work of the second hierarchical beings, exousiae, curiatites, and dunamis and how this all works and weaves together in the cosmos. And finally we see the beings of the first hierarchy, seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. Only now do we have a clear image of the human being before us. We have traced the order of the hierarchies to their activities, and as we allow those activities to pass before the eye of the spirit, EYE, the human being stands before us. As you can see, a mode of observation opens up at the very point where the other stops. Yet only this kind of observation leads us beyond the gates of birth and death. There is no other that tells us about what stretches before birth and beyond death. All that can be described there becomes a matter of actual experience. In the coming lectures, I will show how this becomes real experience. On earth we are surrounded by the mineral, plant and animal kingdoms and by what physical humankind accomplishes in the earthly sense. We direct our gaze toward all that arises from the mineral, plant, animal and physical human being. Likewise, once we have passed through the gate of death and live between death and a new birth, we gaze at activities of the spiritual world directed toward the human being. And we see the human being truly as a product of the activity and accomplishments of the higher spiritual hierarchies. We will also come to realize that unless seen in this light, we cannot understand the forms and structures of the other beings of earth.
Let me add something else in preparation for our coming lectures. Consider the animal. There is something about an animal that reminds us of the human form only in a limited sense. Why is this? An animal cannot duplicate the planetary form inscribed in the ether. Only human beings can become a replication of that form because we strive toward the line that, as I mentioned, focuses the planetary image for us. If it were the destiny of human beings to remain children and never learn to walk but only crawl, which of course it is not, we would never be able to model our forms as human beings from the planetary forms. However, we must duplicate them according to our human organization. We must grow into the planetary forms. But animals cannot do this. They must unfold their lives according to the movements of the planets. They replicate only planetary movements. You see this in every aspect of an animal's body. Consider the skeleton of a mammal. The bones of the spine have a vortex shape which faithfully replicates planetary movements. Regardless of the number of vertebrae in a snake, for example, each one physically copies planetary movements. The moon, our nearest in quotes planet, especially influences one part of the animal. This influence is particularly strong. The skeleton develops and forms the limbs. It then all works together in vortex formations. The other planets, Venus and Mercury, move in spiral formations. The sun's influence, in a sense, fi finishes the skeletal structure. We can even speak of a specific point in the spine where the sun is especially active, the point where the spine tends to transform into the head structure, which displays a transformed spinal vertebra. Saturn and Jupiter work at the point where the bones of the spine rise and, in quotes, puff out, parenthesis, the description used by Goethe and Gegenbauer, close parenthesis, to become skull bones. And to understand the animal's skeletal structure, we follow the direction of the skeleton from the back to front, going from moon to Saturn. To understand the animal form, we cannot relate it to the form of the planets, but to planetary movements. What we work into the glandular system as human beings, the animal works into its whole form and structure. Thus we may say that the animal cannot arrange and order its being according to the form radiated by the planets, but begins directly with planetary movements. The people of ancient times visualized these planetary movements as the paths of planets through the constellations of the zodiac. The ancients could describe the courses of Saturn and other planets as each traveled through the zodiac. Because of their knowledge of animals, they understood the relationship between animal forms and the zodiac, parenthesis, a word that means animal circle, close parenthesis. The zodiac is correctly named as an animal circle. But for us, the essential point is that the animal does not partake of the forms inscribed by the planets in the ether. Only the human being does this. Human beings can do this because the human organism has assumed an upright posture. Consequently, the planetary form becomes an archetype in us whereas we find only the planetary movements replicated in the animal. Here we are presented with a spiritual, suprasensory image of the human being. Everything I have described, the skin, nervous system, cardiovascular system, musculature and skeleton, initially contains only the image of forces. At conception, it is joined to the physical embryo, and takes in the earthly forces and substances. This picture, purely spiritual but at the same time definite, fills itself with earthly substances and forces. As human beings we come down to earth formed and fashioned by the heavens. Initially we are wholly suprasensory, right to our very bones. Then 
we unite with the embryo, the physical human seed. We fill it. At death, we let it fall away again and retain our spirit form as we pass through the gate of death. In conclusion, let us observe the human being while passing through the gate of death. The physical form which we can see by looking into a mirror or at a photograph is no longer there, nor are we interested in it at this point. We look toward the cosmic archetypal image inscribed in the ether. During earthly life this archetypal picture was anchored in our own etheric body, but we did not perceive it. It is present within our physical being on earth, but we do not notice it. Now, however, we see the reality of our own form. This image we see also shines out and radiates forces that have a very different effect. The forces flowing from this archetypal image have the same effect as a radiant body, except that it should be understood as etheric. The sun shines physically. The cosmic image of the human being shines spiritually. And because this image is spiritual, it also has the power to illuminate other things. Here in earthly life, those who have committed good or evil actions can be exposed to the sun for as long as they like. The sun's rays will light up their hair and other physical characteristics, but it will not illuminate their good or evil actions as qualities. The luminous image of our own form which we experience after death, radiates a spiritual light that illuminates the morality of our actions. After death we are confronted by this cosmic image, which illuminates our moral acts. During earthly life this cosmic picture existed within us, where it could be heard faintly as our conscience. After death we view it objectively, we know that we are seeing ourselves and that it must be there for us. We are unrelenting with ourselves after death. Because this luminous image does not conform to any of the excuses we might make here to pardon our sins and emphasize our good actions. Rather, an inexorable judge radiates from us after death by directing a brilliant light upon the value of our acts. Our conscience becomes a cosmic impulse that works outside of us after death. These are the matters that lead us from the earthly to the suprasensory human being, the earthly human being who comes into existence at birth and passes away at death can be understood through anthropology the suprasensory human being, who is merely permeated by earthly substances so that the outer world can manifest, can be understood only through anthroposophy. This is the goal of this lecture course.